Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Mandy. Mandy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks so much for being here. You know, I appreciate it. Mandy, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm a Christian first and foremost. And I'm also a wife, a mother, and someone who values the truth over fantasy and honesty over lies and someone that values love, kindness, and compassion. Yeah, it didn't take me long at all to understand how pure your heart is. You're a really nice lady, and I just hate the idea that you had to go through all the experiences that we're going to talk about tonight. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And for everyone listening, I want to make sure you understand, Mandy deserves a lot of credit for coming on the show tonight and sharing all these experiences with us that she's going to tell us about. It's not easy by a long shot for her to talk about them, and the fact that she's coming on and doing that, that says a lot about her character. Before we get underway, did you know that you hold the record for the longest first conversation I've had with an eyewitness, Mandy? (laughs) No. (laughs) You do. You do. Yeah, I've had my share of three-hour conversations with eyewitnesses, but yeah, we went for five hours in that first conversation, and that's a record. (laughs) Thank you, I guess. Oh, no need to thank me. No need to thank me. That's just what it took to talk about all the things we needed to talk about. You say your first experience with a dog man happened when you were two years old. Does it surprise you that you can remember experiences from such an early age? It did for a while. Um, A lot of people actually made fun of me for the things that I could remember because there's other things that I couldn't really remember. But I remembered all kinds of stuff. I mean, down to like my mom throwing a plate of food at my dad while I was in a high chair. A lot of things. I could remember my first Christmas and certain stuffed animals that I got. and Seeing my dad dress up and try to pretend to be Santa Claus and seeing my mom and my dad kiss as Santa Claus, and then I was for sure thinking she was cheating on him. And that was, that was two. Yeah, those are a lot of memories from such a young age. Obviously, it's very unusual for a person to be able to remember anything from such an early age, but there is an explanation for it. Most people can't remember anything from their early childhood because of what's known as childhood amnesia. There are some people, however, who can recall things from when they were two, the way you can. So your situation isn't exactly unprecedented. I wanted to make sure you understood that. Yes, I do understand that. And I appreciate you actually not just confirming, but actually being able to understand that there are people that can remember things from their childhood, especially when it comes to any type of traumatic events. It's like the brain takes it from one extreme to the other. You either hold on to it as a memory that is very vivid or it's too much for your mind to comprehend. So it's like you disassociate from it. You're spot on. This next question is one of the many things we're going to talk about that's so difficult for you to talk about, Mandy, but I do want to ask you nonetheless because this is an important part of your story. Please tell us about the dog, Keo, you had back then since he played such a big part in these experiences. Yeah, he did. He was, he was my heart. (laughs) So we were born on the same day and, um, 
He was a, a giant Alaska Malamute. And literally, we grew up together. And he was in the house early on until he just got so big that that he had to be booted out because he was just he was too big. A lot of Malamutes now are not full-blooded Malamutes. A lot of them are mixed with Husky or another type of variation of a dog. But this one, full-blooded, beautiful. He, he actually had an Indian name that was given to him, <sighs> meaning protector. And he was very much a protector. He was just amazing absolutely amazing he was never mean and never growled at us really just he was he was almost like a dad in a way he was great and you could ride on him he was like a horse and when he was tired of you he sit down and let you slide off his back and if you got on his nerves he would flip me and my sister over and one paw on one back one paw on the other and no pressure but just like okay I've had enough with you and we're just laying there can't do anything about it but he never hurt us he was very protective of us he didn't like us getting in trouble by our parents because it was kind of like, he was so protective that it was, wait, if anybody's going to get on to them, it's going to be me, not y'all. And if you were laying in the floor, he was there. So it's like my dad would lay down and you couldn't even see my dad, my dog. And he wasn't even, I mean, he looked like bigger than a German shepherd when he was like one years old. Uh, he was a huge, huge dog. Uh, people thought he was a bear because he was like the size of a black bear. Um, if he stood on his hind legs, he reached about 6'2", six 6'4". Six he was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And he was the biggest thing that I'd ever seen in my entire life. And he wasn't scared of anything. And I spent most of my time with him um, from very early on. Inside the house, when he was outside, it was your outside playing. I was always singing to him. I just absolutely loved my dog. Loved him. Oh, I can understand why. He sounds like such a great dog. Yeah. I think now would be a good time for a little levity, Mandy. As you were telling us about Keo right there, I was thinking to myself, should I give Mandy a break and not ask her how milk bones taste or not? <laughs> well, <laughs> guess what I decided? Oh, that's all right. Yeah. We had a little thing where we shared food a lot. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, that's some of my, some of my best memories are actually... Not just singing to him, but uh, sharing food with him. Like my favorite was blueberry yogurt, hands down, still my favorite. Like with real blueberries, not that fake stuff, real blueberries. And I would take a bite. He would get a bite. I would take a bite. He would get a bite. And then I would give him his milk bone dog biscuit and he would eat half of it. And then he always gave me half and he would push it back over to me and I did I mean there goes my parents should have been watching me right but I, I did I ate them I ate them and I don't know they must not have tasted bad <laughs> because I ate them for years which is probably why I have such a good memory <laughs> and it's probably why you have such good teeth too <laughs> maybe maybe well hey i hear they're good for your teeth or good for dog's teeth so maybe there's something to that i don't know maybe there is <laughs> yeah there might be <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
All right, Mandy, please don't forget you're amongst friends here, and I really do think you're going to benefit from sharing your experiences with us. Whenever you're ready, please give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. <sighs> okay. So, first, let me let me uh, kind of give you a little bit of, I guess you'd say, like a layout. I'm a very visual person, so maybe people will actually appreciate that. Uh, so, where I lived. In Georgia. I lived in Decatur at the time. And we had a driveway that that went up and like the subdivision, it was kind of an older subdivision. And of course, being very close to Stone Mountain, it's heavily wooded. We actually had a really nice big yard. And the house the main floor would be what I would call the first floor because the front sidewalk took you straight up to the front door that also had a screen door on it. So I would call it a shotgun house because if you opened up that door, the living room was open to the kitchen, which also had a little eating area. And then a sliding glass door that led to the backyard. And the backyard was fenced. And inside the fence was an additional fence off to the side. So a fence within a fence. And that's where Keo eventually got put. And he had a doghouse and everything. And then the rest of the yard, there was a garden. And there was swing set and like a little patio. And then coming back inside, so if you're standing from the front door and you're looking out towards the backyard, you would have some stairs that went up that took you to where the bedrooms and the bathrooms were. And then there were some stairs that went down that went to what could be like a called a bonus room nowadays. Um, And that's also where the laundry was. So my room was, as soon as you went up the stairs, it was the first room on the right, which also overlooked where the front door was and the driveway and the sidewalk thing that took you up to the front door. So... From the time that I was born, I always had trouble sleeping. My dad would always play the guitar. So he spent a lot of time playing the guitar and rocking me, holding me, trying to soothe me to get me back to sleep. He said I was the most difficult sleeper. And that really proved all the way up, even to now, I still have trouble sleeping. So I would wake up just like so many different noises would wake me up. And I always enjoyed looking out of my windows as well. So with this, I just had that one window. But, you know, I would sneak up to make sure of course my parents weren't awake and then I would sneak over to my window and look out the window because I loved looking at the moon and the stars and the trees that was my most favorite thing to do from the time I could walk that was just like that's where I'm gonna be I'm gonna be outside I'm gonna be looking at the trees it was so peaceful so I was up and I was looking And I was hearing the screen door being jiggled. And it wasn't unusual necessarily to have the screen door kind of somebody being there sometimes because like my aunt lived just down the hill. Like you could see her house from our backyard. 
she just lived down the hill and my mom actually watched our cousins with us while my aunt worked so there was even one time that my aunt had to call and get my dad because my cousin he had stopped breathing in his crib so we were so close that I think part of me was just like, oh, maybe it's my aunt. And so I look out the window and I'm not seeing anything, but I'm still kind of hearing some jiggling. So I go down the stairs and I, I just notice like what I thought was just a really, really big shadow. And even that young, I could look at my shadow outside as I'm playing and I can see that it's a lot of times it was much larger than me. So in my mind, I'm going, Oh, I just don't know who it is. So I backed a little closer to the wall right where uh, the kitchen would start. So I'm a little closer to the sliding glass door to the backyard. And as I'm standing there just looking, this thing starts walking by the by the windows. So you have the door, the front door, and then that's that wall is where they also put like the couch and there was two windows that were right there and this thing walks by the windows and it's really big and it's walking towards the side of the house where the fence is and it was like it didn't take very long before you had that really sick feeling. And so I turned around and I guess I really kind of expected it to be Keo, but it, but it wasn't in this, This thing was really, really, really big. And it had to almost squat down a little bit to look at me because it was taller than the glass door. And um, and it was that one had yellowy kind of eyes and they it was like they glowed and um and it had a little bit of like what I would kind of call like a mane on it and it had a muzzle and And it had claws and weird looking hands. They were, it was just weird. And, and it looked at me and then it kind of grinned and then it grabbed the sliding glass door handle and started to pull it. And at this time, I was maybe, maybe four feet away from it. So I was looking around for my dog. And he was, he wasn't there because they had already, they had already put him outside. And I, I didn't know if this thing was going to come inside or if it might eat my dog. 
but my dog wasn't making any noise. And so I screamed and I started trying to get up the stairs as fast as I could. And I was screaming that a devil cat, I kept saying, the devil cat gonna get me. The devil cat going to get me. And so my parents got up and and they were like, oh, you had a nightmare. You had a bad dream. You know, it's it's that you just you had a nightmare. And I told them that it was downstairs. And my dad checked. There was nothing. And then he checked and opened up the door. It was like Keo. And Keo kind of popped his head out of the doghouse. And he was like, see, he's fine. It was a bad dream. You need to just go back to bed. And I was like, can I, you know, can, can I sleep with y'all? And, and now that part, I don't remember if they let me sleep with them that night or not, but that was definitely the beginning of nightmares that it just replayed over and over and over again. That this thing, every time, every night, that I would go to sleep, multiple times during the night, I would have the same dream. It would be over and over and over again. And the same situation, I would scream, I would cry, I would tell them it's the devil cat, it's trying to get in, it's jiggling the handles, it's pulling on the door, it wants to get in. And this went on for years. And then after a couple of years of just these nightmares that they, you know, just kept telling me that it didn't really happen. That it was just all in my head. And they really got into this Michael Jackson thriller thing. And, um, by this time, I'm like four. And it's my birthday. And that's when his video for Thriller came out. And it was a big deal. They were going to play it on TV. It was. <laughs> and so, like. It seems like everybody's coming over to the house to see, you know, so all of us kids are in the floor. They're kind of debating back and forth. Should the kids actually see it? Will it scare them? We heard that it has a werewolf, blah, 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 blah. And anyway, it was decided that, that we could, we could see it. And to this day, whenever that song plays, like I have to leave. I, I can I cannot hear that song. I, it's it's creepy. It's scary. It terrifies me because. So I'm four now, and I'm sitting there, and that video comes on, and everybody's like so excited about it and then he changes into the werewolf thing and i'm screaming and i'm like it's not exactly what i saw but man it's close enough that i was going like the devil can't look like like that, just bigger, a lot bigger, a lot bigger and, and more like an animal. And 
you know, they're trying to calm me down and I'm just, I'm scared. So I just go into my room and I'm just, I'm bawling and I'm like putting myself into like, I would sleep in such a tight little ball against the wall. I just, I hated it. I hated it. And I even remember like one night that, because I started getting in trouble for always waking them up or after a, a while, I mean, I can, I can understand. I mean, me being a mom, I can kind of understand like parents really, they need sleep. I understand that. I understand it more now than what I used to understand it. So I'm sure after a while, it just got to where they had to make a decision that somebody needed to be able to get some sleep. They needed to be able to function as parents. And something needed to be done. So I kind of got, I got in trouble for having nightmares and always waking up and waking them up and then trying to sleep in their bed and in their room. And and there was even one night that I was asleep, but I woke up from a nightmare, the same nightmare, the same scenario, the devil cat trying to get in. And then all of a sudden it's behind me and it's trying to get in. And when I wake up, I decided not to scream. But I was just so scared that I was just frozen. And I remember like I didn't even blink. I I just laid there. And I remember my parents walking in. And I remember them having a, a discussion about, is she asleep? I don't know. Her eyes are open. That's really weird. Like, we, she's looking at us, but she looks like she's asleep. And then they had a discussion on whether or not to close my eyes for me. And, and I just remember they decided to just leave it be. And they walked out and, you know, closed the door. And I just laid there until I think I finally just ended up falling asleep. But I just laid there just staring into the darkness of my room, just now even more vividly seeing this thing in my mind all the time. It never went away. And then just to be told that it was just a dream Instead of thinking that maybe it might have actually happened. And so the nightmares got so bad that one night in the middle of the night, I mean, it is the middle of the night. It's maybe two or three in the morning or no, maybe it was one. It was so still, that's still the middle of the night. One, two or three a.m. Take your pick. It doesn't matter. Nobody wants to be woken up at that time. And my aunt came up. And she had this necklace that was going to make it all go away. And um, so it's like a like a silver dollar coin, but it's gold plated. And it had, or it has, because I'm looking at it right now. And it has like an ordinate frame around it. And then a chain. It hangs on a chain. And that thing is super heavy. Super heavy. And I remember them sitting me down on my parents' bed. And explaining to me how this, if I wear it every night. It's a magical necklace and it's going to keep the devil cat away. And as long as I'm wearing it, the devil cat can't get me. And so, you know, I'm like, I'm four years old. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm 
willing to try anything. And right now I'm like, at that age, I'm still really trusting my parents. And so every night I'm trying to wear it. And for a little while, it seemed to have worked. And I was like, oh, wow, finally. Finally, if I'm awake, I'm not awake because of a nightmare. I'm awake because, you know, I'm just woke up and I can just look out the window or I can go downstairs and look outside and I can see Keo and he's laying in front of the sliding glass door. And then other times I could st see him in the fence where his doghouse was. And then I could go back upstairs and go to sleep and nobody knew that I had gotten up. But the nightmares came back. And they were, they were always the same. It just literally replayed the memory over and over again. Except for sometimes it would happen during the day. And it was trying to get in during the day. Sometimes the nightmare was that as it's trying to get in, my mom is standing right there. And then... She turns around, even though it's standing right there in front of her, and she would say, I don't see it. What are you talking about? And those nightmares really started bothering me. I think the older I got, the more it would involve me dreaming about my parents telling me also that they didn't see it. They don't see it. And it's like literally right there, right there in front of them or right there behind them. And they would, in my dream, they would say, we don't see it. And that was really hard. So the only one that I really talked to after a while was just my dog. And I would tell my dog about it. And then I would also tell him, I know that you know that it was real because I know that you saw it too. And usually that's when he would put his front legs around me and he would actually wrap his front paws around my legs. And it was almost like he would hold me. And he usually would sit like that with me when I would talk to him about the devil cat that I saw. And I know that he saw it too. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. I know it's hard. Take your time. There's no hurry. Just whenever you're ready in your own good time, continue on. But again, there's no hurry. Okay. All right. So, like a year or so later, they decided it was time to move. And um, I mean, I remember going around and looking at places with them. I remember one place that, I mean, we were so super excited about. We were like, oh, this has got a pool. Oh, man, you know, that's like a kid's dream is to get a place with a pool. And I remember... I really thought that we were probably going to get that place. I mean, it had a creek, and that was one of the big things was a Malamute down in Georgia really is not the best situation for the dog. It's really too hot for them. 
So a creek would be a huge plus. But this house, it, it was it was creepy. My mom really thought that somebody probably died in it. And she was like, I don't get a good feeling about this place at all. So we ended up not actually going through with buying that place. Or they, I was not buying the place, they were. So we went down to Covington. And it was really towards Madison. And there was a really nice ranch house that had lots of acreage. And it had what I always called a creepy old barn. I mean, this barn was huge, really, really big. But most of it could not be used because of the damage that was done. Ah, but it had it had lots of land. It had lots of beautiful trees. More than just pine trees. That was the deal. I mean, the hardwood trees, the oaks. Oh, they were so beautiful. So this was the place that we ended up getting. It also had a creek that ran the back side of the property. And so I even remember the night that we moved in. Like, it was so long. It was such a long night. And I remember I just fell asleep in a chair. I had a blanket. And, I mean, it was probably three or four in the morning. And I just remember, I think I was just in the living room. We, they were still moving stuff all around us, but I was just, I was so tired. And I think that was one of the better nights that I actually had some good sleep. Because I literally remember thinking right before I closed my eyes, thank God. No more devil cat. That thing is nowhere near me. I will never have to see that thing again. And it doesn't matter that they don't believe me. But I'm just so glad that I don't ever have to see that thing again. The next few days, I just remember like dancing a jig in the middle of my bedroom floor. Just so happy that I was so far away from this thing. And we went straight into taking care of the yard and clearing out in between trees. And then that turned into beautiful weekends with my dad, clearing out parts of the woods especially by that old creepy barn, because if you're going to use the barn at all, some of the stuff needed to be like, it needed to have some breathing room because it was that creepy. Like something was hiding in there. And I always had that feeling. And I would even say, are you sure nothing lives up in there? Because on that top section, you can't see, but it just, I just always felt like something was there watching me. But then I would be like, my dad's right here. My dog is right here. We're all walking into the woods together. Nothing's going to get me when my dog's there. And so I remember we would take walks through the woods and we would go back to the creek. And my dad had a knack for finding old logs that had like fallen over just right. And he always called them bouncy logs. So, you know, we're taking a trip through the woods. You stop and there's a bouncy log. We'll get on the log and let me bounce y'all a little bit. That was great fun. And then muscadine vines hanging like everywhere. And those were swinging vines and he would swing us on them. I mean, it's like 
the perfect place, the perfect playground for kids that actually like the outdoors. My sister wasn't such an outdoors person, but I was. I absolutely loved it. And I lived for these walks. I would try not to bug them about it. But if we could take these walks into the woods and do these two things, my favorite things, and take a trip to the creek. Because seeing my dog just like run and throw himself into the creek, I mean, it, it makes me happy to see people happy or to make people happy. And Keo was my people. He was my heart. He was my soul. And seeing him happy, that was just, it was wonderful. So th these were just like the best times that we had. And then we would go and tag trees. This tree looks good. We want to move that to the yard. So you go out there with a wheelbarrow, you dig up that tree, you bring it back and you plant the thing. And, you know, I always thought I was doing so much to help, but I was probably more of a hindrance than a help. But he let me go with him. And those are the best memories, really, of my childhood. And at the creek one time, and this wasn't too long after we moved in. I saw this really huge print close to Keo's print. And I was like, what is this? And I remember my dad looking at it and going, man, that's really big. And he said, well, it's probably a bear. And I was always told I was over dramatic. So you don't tell an over dramatic little girl that there's a bear. So I look around and I'm like, are you serious? Now we have bear. I have to worry about being attacked and eaten by a bear. And then he's like, no, 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 no. Maybe it's, maybe it's not a bear. He was like, well, I don't think we have any mountain lions. I was like, really? We have cougars? I'm going to have to worry about being attacked by a cougar? And so in my mind, I'm going, if the devil cat wasn't bad enough, now I have to worry about bears and mountain lions. These things are going to eat me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't ever go to the woods by myself. And my dad was just like, oh, stop being dramatic. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's probably long gone from here. So, you know, I'm still in the whole trust your parents thing. And <laughs> it wasn't too long after that. It started. Um, Uh, so now I guess I should actually kind of give you the layout of, of this house because obviously I'm still talking. So, you know, that some, some stuff happened. So so it's a ranch style house. So one floor. And a pretty long driveway. So you pull into the driveway and you go up and you wrap around. The front yard is really big. And then you pull around, uh, let's see, the front side of the house. Nobody really ever went to the front side of the house because the driveway wrapped around and pulled into really the side of the house where there was a carport and there was a door as well. And when you walked into that door, you're walking straight into the kitchen and the dining room, which is just really not a wide area. It was more long 
than it was wide. So the kitchen was to the left and the little dining area was to the right. And it's got windows, one, two, three, maybe three windows, maybe four. And then there was right at the kitchen, there's a doorway and a door that led to what my dad used as an office. And that was really the front part of the house that you saw from the street. And that was pretty big, a pretty big area. And then straight from the, the door, when you walk in from the carport, there was an open area and like a little half wall that separated the kitchen, the dining, and the living room. So on the other side of that half wall was a glass door and a screen door. And then you have some windows in the living room. And then there's a hallway. And as you went down the hallway, the first little room on the right was the laundry room. You went a little further and on the right was a hall bath. And then to the left was my sister's room. Then to the right was my parents' room. And then at the end of the hallway to the left was my room. So my room is at the very end of the house. And I guess you could say my parents' room was too. And my room was set up that really the only place for my bed to go would be as soon as you're looking through the doorway was the wall that was straight ahead, but kind of a little to the right. And so you have a twin size bed. And if you put it all the way against the wall at the head of the bed was a window, um, just a little off to the left but it was still like right there. Like all I had to do was roll over, look up out of my window and I could see the moon as it passed from window to window. And at the foot of my bed was another window. So when it came to the windows, let's just say you were standing outside of the window. For one thing, the windows were not all that low to the ground. Even as a teenager, if I was standing out, it would take quite a bit of effort on my part at five foot two to try to reach up onto the brick to try to pull myself up to get myself into the window. If that gives you a uh, height range from off the ground. My side of the house, you had trees. The woods started like right there. There were some trees, really beautiful, beautiful trees. And then within about 10 or 15 feet, the heavy woods started but it's really just all wooded right there. I mean, if you were to look at the house, it's like most of it is completely out in the open except for my side, which was heavily wooded. So if you could see in the windows, if you were standing outside, you could see me in the bed. You, you could see the bed from either window. You're looking at that. So um, we really didn't have curtains. There were some curtains that were kind of just, you know, like sheer curtains, but that was more the kitchen and um, the living room. The rest of us kind of just had um, old body towels that you just thumbtack into the window frame to just kind of give a little bit of covering and um, 
one, I hated it because it obscured the beautiful view that I had. And then at other times of the year, you really would have liked to have something that completely blocked everything out. So it wasn't, it wasn't that long after we um, moved into the house and then, you know, I'm thinking that we got bear and cougars are out there and, but playing out in the yard and then having our dog and I didn't always have a creepy feeling. And I really enjoyed watching the sunset a lot with my dog. For one thing, I hated having to leave him outside and not have him in the house with me because I really felt like he was my only friend that I had. But a lot of times whenever I would be out watching the sunset with him, he would start pushing me back towards the house. And I'm not understanding why. But, but going in to the house and, you know, like after dinner and after all of that, it's time to Take a bath, get ready to go to bed. So go and get in bed and, and I'm laying there and I'm looking out at the stars and at the moon and I just end up having that weird, sick feeling that Something's not right. And you kind of get that weird cold sweat. And I started getting nauseated. And um, I don't know what to think about it until the hair starts standing up like all over your body. And I was looking really intently out the foot of my bed, out the window, because I kept feeling like I was being stared at. And so I'm looking, trying to see if I could see. And I just see this, like, like I mean you would you would say it was blue eye shine except for it wasn't like eye shine it reminded me more of like a lightning bug the cold fusion how they can just light up from the inside it literally looked like these really big blue eyes that were emitting light from the inside. They were high and I didn't know what to think. I didn't know if that was maybe flashlights. So I'm still very intently trying to figure out what I'm looking at and why I feel the way I feel. And I'm kind of thinking maybe an owl, but it wasn't because then it started moving closer from tree to tree as it moved closer to the window. And so I could see that it was a big black mass of a thing 
And um, it was black, but it had a, like, kind of like if you had ashes from a fireplace, you kind of put, put that a little bit on top of the fur. It was really big. And it just kept coming closer and closer to the window. And so I just, you know, tried to make myself as small or, you know, as skinny as possible, as flat as possible. And I tried not to even breathe because the next thing I knew is it was looking in the window. And it would look in both windows. It took a while for me to realize that there were two of them. But, um, so I, uh, I ended up getting up and, you know, going and getting my parents and waking them up. And, um, uh, you know, of course it was the whole, there's nothing there. You just having another nightmare. It's just, you know, the devil cat. Do you still have that necklace, you know, that your aunt gave you? And, um, by this time, uh, my dad, he started getting into the howling movies. And, um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too long after this first incident that, uh, that I started hearing, uh, werewolf talk more. And, um, and I would have this creepy feeling. And then I would look out my windows, of course, and then see these things again moving from the tree line of the woods towards the window. And, you know, during the day, I'm thinking, okay, so at night, these things come. But during the day, I'm okay. I'm safe. I don't see these things. And, you know, Keo doesn't seem to be acting up. And and it was always, well, you know, he would let us know if there was something here. And, of course, I'm thinking back to the devil cat going, well, if he was smart, which I know that he is, he would pretend he's not here either. He would make himself look as small as possible. And you just hope that they don't see you. And um, so my, my dad had the bright idea. Um, well, I know how to get her to stay in her bed at night. So he... Um, Tucking me in one night, he was like, there's a, there's a werewolf that lives underneath your bed. And if you get out of your bed in the middle of the night, it's going to get you. It's going to attack you. And I was like, really? I was like, where does it live? And he said that there was a trap door underneath my bed that led to under the house where this thing lived. And that if I needed to get up and go to the bathroom, 
I would have to make sure I had a good clearing because it would reach out and try to grab me. But if I could make it to the door in time and I got the door open before it got out from underneath the bed, then it would, it would go back in and it wouldn't get me. Hey, it's okay. I'll tell you what, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay. All right, Mandy, whenever you're ready, not a moment sooner, please continue. Okay. So I decided one night that I would go down the hallway and um, sneak through his office come around through the kitchen and sneak to the little doorway where the living room was to see what this werewolf looked like that was probably living underneath my bed. So it was one of the nights that he was watching one of those howling movies. And um, yeah, so I, I snuck around and um, got to see one of the most disturbing things I think I ever saw. And then also to see the entertainment that comes from that. That's just really, I don't see why people enjoy getting scared to death because that's not the type of adrenaline rush I'm looking for. And so I'm trying really hard in that moment to be as quiet as possible as I gasp and uh, throw my hands over my mouth in disbelief that now this did not quite look like the things that would come to my window, but it was close enough. It was close enough. So I'm going back down the hallway and I get to the edge of my door, the door frame, and I step a foot in and then I then it hits me. How am I going to get back in bed without this thing getting me? And so. I go back out into the hallway. And I decide that I'm going to try to get a running start. And then just try to jump into my bed. So I did. And yeah, as a kid, probably, you know, I would like to say that I jumped from the doorway and landed in my bed, but I'm sure I was a lot closer than that. But either way, I waited. Nothing grabbed me. I was in the bed. And I was shaking and I was trying to be as quiet as possible because I didn't want to get in trouble. And I hated disappointing my parents. And so I didn't want to disturb them. And I knew that I was really on my own to deal with this type stuff. So I don't even know how I ended up going back to sleep that night. But the next day I'm, I'm outside and I'm singing and playing and talking with my dog and walking around towards the, the old creepy barn. And, um, I thought, well, I'm far enough away from the house now. I'm going to ask Keo if he sees the things that I see. And so I was telling him all about it. And then I told him all about, you know, the, the movie my dad was watching and what he said. And then I was like, I don't know what to do. They won't let you come in the house anymore. I don't know if I'm going to be okay. I don't know if this thing is going to, I already have one inside underneath my bed. And, you know, he just ends up like laying down 
I sat down and then he just put his front paws around me again. And I just leaned back on him and I was crying and it, it was, it was, it was a bad, bad, bad day. And then I just remember telling him that, okay, it's just you and me, you know, that these things are here and I know that they're here and I just don't know what we're going to do about it. So my dog also would, um, his favorite toys were tennis balls and his favorite was new tennis balls. If they were nice, clean, neon green, that was his ideal toy. So there was a subdivision a little ways down the road from us. And um, they had like a little tennis court area and tennis balls. And he would go on tennis ball runs in the middle of the night. Not all the time, but when he thought his were dirty enough, he would go and get him some new tennis balls. Yes, he stole them. He stole them. However, most people that saw him knew that he was our dog because he was the only one of his kind. And people would say, well, we know it's your dog because um, he's the only one that looks like a bear. And when he's walking down the road and he likes to hit it, you, all you see is instead of teeth, you see like neon green tennis balls shoved in his mouth. And he would, he would come back with, I don't know, three, four tennis balls. And, um, he also, to keep cool, where the glass door was, there was a little deck. And the house was all brick. So in order for him to keep cool, he had dug a ditch out right next to the brick wall. And he dug down at the foundation so that he could lay down there and get cool because it it was just really hot during you know most of the spring all of the summer and that's where he was a lot of times if it was just too hot for him to be out and about after he would play with us or we would take our walk we would watch the sunset he would settle in and that's where he slept if he was not put inside the little, or not the little fence, it was actually a really big fence area. If my dad didn't have him in the fence area, he had him just underneath the deck, Keo really, he was very obedient. So it was one of those, when everybody's gone during the day, you're in the fence, but at night, we'll let you have your, your run around the place. Plus, I think it also made them feel better that if anything did come up, they thought, you know, Keo will take care of it. We liked to have campouts. And our idea of camping out was put a tent up on the deck, throw some lounge chairs in the tent, a pillow and some blankets and you're good to go. That's as, I mean, we love the outdoors, but I did not really want to be out at night. Well, let me back up and say this. Parts of the year, you didn't have the creepy feeling. Parts of the year, there was no problems looking out my window and I would even try to look for something thinking it's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's going to come back. And it just didn't. So for like several months, there would just be nothing but peacefulness and it wasn't creepy. And that, I was still terrified of the werewolf that was under the bed. However, 
I didn't have to worry about the ones coming to my windows. So a couple of years after dealing with this, I started realizing that it was more at the beginning of fall. And I still love fall. But at the beginning of fall, the creepy feeling would start. But I still really loved fall. That's still like one of my favorite times of year. So at this time, it was like we were going to have one more camp out before school started. And it's probably the end of August at this time. So usually the creepy feeling didn't start until sometime in September. So in my mind, I was thinking there's no problem with this idea that we have about camping out. So we had a hammock that was maybe about maybe 15, 20 feet away from the glass door and the deck that was hung between two trees, not too far away from Keo's doghouse. And whenever we would camp out, my parents would leave the glass door open and just close the screen door, but leave that unlocked. And they would sleep on the couches in the living room just in case something happened. They thought that would give them plenty of time to get up and, you know, get us and everything would be fine. So um, we really, 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 really wanted to sleep in the hammock. So we set it up and the stars were so beautiful that night and the wind that would blow through the trees. That's one of the most peaceful, enjoyable sounds that I think one could ever hear. And I have to admit, I really was sleeping pretty good. I really was. There for a while, I knew Keo was right underneath us because, one, you could hear him breathing. And two, every once in a while, I really remembered this earlier today whenever I had some of the pictures out looking at him, that he would put his head up and just kind of like lick my hand through the holes. And had he not been on the ground, I probably would have slept with him. But I, I don't really like ants and I don't like spiders. So not going to not about to sleep on. Oh, and snakes. Don't do it. Uh, -uh. So I thought, no, I'm not, I can never like sleep on the ground. Oh, so in the hammock I was. So that's really why when this next incident happened, why I really thought that it was Keo. So I'm sleeping. Okay. So I'm sleeping and then I feel something breathing on my neck. And really, really, really nasty, just repulsive, um, wet, mildewy dog smell. And, um, and the breath was, I mean, it was hot. It was hot breath. And it was right, if you're laying on your back, which if you're in a hammock, you must sleep on your back. And my head was off to the side. And so on the right side of my neck, it's being 
breathe it upon and I smell the smell and I wake up and I'm like, Oh man. I was like, Keo, you need a bath so bad. You stink. What have you been doing? And I thought maybe he like went on a tennis ball run. Maybe he got into some water or something. I don't know, but I thought maybe he's sweaty too because, you know, it's hot. It wasn't all that hot. It was actually a really nice time of year, which is really why we decided to go ahead and like try to do the sleep out because it was a really nice night. But I was just like, okay, man, that's bad. Don't be breathing on me anymore because that's just like, ugh. It, it makes. I've got to go to the bathroom. So I get up as carefully as possible so I don't wake up my sister. And I get down and I start walking towards the deck. And I get to the deck. And as soon as I go to put my foot on the step, and it only has like, I mean, it's a small deck. So it only has like maybe three steps, maybe four at the most. And um, I hear a low growl from underneath the deck where Keo usually lays, which literally is right below the glass door and the screen door. And it hits me that this is not my dog. Because what I thought was my dog was back there by the hammock, but yet something is underneath the deck growling at me. So I wanted so bad just to just run into the house, close and lock the doors, but I couldn't because my sister is in the hammock. So I turned around and I looked at her and I thought, no matter how much they've made fun of me and that they've never believed me, and I don't talk about it. I still love her. And I don't want her to, to get hurt. And I don't want her to see this thing. So. I go back over to the hammock. And I'm waking her up. And I said we need to go inside. I'm really scared. And she's like. There's nothing to be scared about. I was like, no. So I started crying and I was like, we need to go inside now. I'm really, really, really scared. And so she said, okay. And so we got up, we got the stuff and I was like, hurry, hurry, go, 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 go. And so she went in and then I made it up the stairs. And then when I went to pull the screen door closed, I remember I'm shaking so bad that it has that stupid little lock that is, I don't even know if it's a centimeter tall. It's that stupid little lock that you just like flip it down or you flip it up. And I'm thinking how stupid this whole thing is because it cannot protect you from anything. These screen doors are just pathetic, absolutely pathetic. And I felt so stupid trying to close it and trying to quit shaking in order to actually get the little latch flipped so that it would be locked, which even I had just come and jerked it open before. And then I was going to have to move. Once I got that closed and locked, I had to move off to the side to then pull the glass door to push it closed. And as I'm 
pushing the glass door closed. I get that feel and I'm being looked at. And I look up. And at the hammock. At the tree. Where my head was. There's this. What I call a werewolf. And by this time, I already knew that the devil cat was also a werewolf. And it was looking at me. The same glowing blue eyes. Now these, they didn't have the the mane, the the longer hair around the around the neck, the way the first one did, and of course the eye color was different. The hand was resting where my head was. And these things have the weirdest looking, I mean, it's not like to me, it's not a thumb. It's, it's like a little shorter than the other fingers, but it doesn't sit off to the side the way ours does. And I'm shaking. I'm trying to lock the door. And I really realized at this time that I had thought that with, uh, with the towels, as even how pathetic those were as curtains, I guess to me, I, in that moment, I thought this is the first time that it ever saw me, all of me. And it's hard to even describe the amount of vulnerability that you feel when um, when you lock eyes with something that uh, I've heard people describe it as that it looked into your soul or that it sucked the soul out of you. I really felt like it took everything from me, including my energy. I don't think I, I have felt so exhausted, drained, um, vulnerable in, in such a way that I didn't know if I was going to be okay. Because I thought, now this thing knows exactly what I look like. And not only that, it knows exactly what I smell like. And it intentionally smelled me. And even at such a young age, I knew that when any type of dog smells you that means something and it can mean good or it can mean bad and I know that this thing was intentionally looking at me and so I ended up screaming and I was crying when I finally felt like I had my voice 
because when you're that scared, it's like you can't even make any sound. No matter how much you try, it's for some reason, it's like your body does not register what your mind is telling you to do. So by the time I did and my dad, you know, is on the couch and he wakes up and he's like, what is it? What is it? And I was like, there's a werewolf outside. And he was like, no, it's not. And I was like, yes, there is. And it was at the hammock and there, and there was one under the deck and it, and it growled and, and no, it's not. It was probably Keo, you know, or it was another dog, you know, Keo's there. And I'm like, he is not there. He is not there. It was not Keo. And, um, so he went to open the door and I was like, don't open the door. And he was like, there's nothing there. So I'm looking and I'm looking and I'm trying so hard to find it in the darkness and all of that. And no, you can't see anything. Nothing seems to be there. And he walks out and he's like, Keo. And sure enough, here comes Keo from a tennis ball run coming from the side of our neighbor's yard, <sighs> coming on into the side of our front yard, not where there's woods. And um, he was like, see, there's nothing. Kia would let us know if something was going on. You need to go back to bed. And I was like, well, okay, we're not camping out. I'm, I'm scared. He was like, you know, that's fine. So I started thinking, well, now I have to get past the werewolf that's underneath my bed. So I was like, Dad, will you please, please carry me to my bed? And he said, yes. So he did. And he was putting me in the bed. And I just thought, you know, it's time for me to ask him something. So I said, Dad, how come the werewolf never attacks you and you can stand at my bed? But it never attacks you. And I, I don't remember his exact words. However, it was something to the effect of, it only wants you. So, I said, why me? And he said, I don't know. It just wants you. It's only interested in you. It's only there for you. It's special for you. So good night. Everything's fine. And he leaves. And by that time, I don't know if you've ever been scared, but by that time, all of a sudden you got to pee really bad. <laughs> and I stayed up. I don't know, for several hours because I needed to go to the bathroom, but I was really scared. And then all of this happened. And now here I am in the bed. I thought, well, I'm safe now, but now I've got to pee. So I waited and I thought, okay, well now, now I can get up. So when I went to make a move, the blue eyes were right there at the windows. One was on one window, one was on the other. And they were looking at me. And so I was like, 
Now I'm surrounded. I don't want to move. And so I tried to get as close to the wall as possible. And there was the gap between the wall and the bed because it made it easier for you to um, make your bed. The comforter, you weren't trying to like shove it down in between something. It, uh, you could just easily pull it over. I didn't want to get too close to either edge of the bed because I was also told that if I got too close or if I hung anything off, that the werewolf underneath the bed would grab me. So I don't know how I got to sleep that night. But the next morning, I remember it was a Sunday. I got up and the first thing that I did was I will never sleep underneath a comforter and a sheet again. I am going to make my bed and it will be the last time that I ever have to make my bed. I'm going to push my bed all the way against the wall. The mattress will touch the wall and it will touch the wall at the head of the bed. That way, I don't have to worry about at least one side of the bed. And so I don't know how I did it, but I did it. Sheer determination that it was going to go against the bed and I was not going to ask for help because no more, no more was I going to talk to anybody about this. And I wasn't going to mention it anymore. No matter how scared I was, I wasn't going to say anything else to my family. Because in that moment when I woke up that morning, I told myself that it was time to wake up and to realize that you cannot trust your parents. And... So, <laughs> oddly enough, to this day, I still don't sleep underneath sheets and comforters. And, of course, now my husband and my family have understood why, that it's always been like that. That was my way of dealing with it and doing something about it to protect myself. Or so what I thought would protect myself. And I got made fun of for that. I was told that I was lazy. And I'm not lazy. But I was told that I was lazy. That I did that just because I didn't want to ever have to make my bed. And that my room was messy. They never asked me why. They never asked why. But I started making plans. And I started setting my traps in my room. I mean, to the fact that several times they would make comments like, oh, it looks like maybe a tornado came through. So I got made fun of a lot. But to me, I thought, well, I'm going to battle for myself and I'm going to do everything I can to try to stay alive. So I made a way that I thought, that if I needed to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, that even if these things tried to get in or the werewolf underneath my bed tried to jump out, that maybe there would be enough things in the way that they would trip 
and it would give me time to reach the door so that I could get out of my room. Because he told me if I made it to the door and I got it open, they would stop. So that was my my way of doing what I could. And that's how I lived for years. Wow. No kid, no person should have to go through a fourth of the things you've been through. And you haven't even shared all of your experiences with us yet. I'll tell you what, let's call it and just have you tell us about your other encounters next week if you're okay with doing that. What do you think? Can you handle that? Absolutely. Okay, good. Let's do it that way then. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming on and telling us about those experiences. I hate to see the pain you're going through by doing that, but like I told you before, there will be a net gain by you doing this. But having said that, try to have a good night, and thanks again so much for your time. Thank you. Oh, you know you're welcome.